Hi, I'm Deboki and this is Okie Dokie Boki. And today I'm gonna to be talking about three books that I should have talked about last year, but didn't. One of the things I talked about in my 2021 recap video is that I like just for whatever reason, I'm not feeling super inspired to do a best of worst of reading list for 2021. At the same time, there is definitely a feeling for me that like, if I look back on my 2021 and look back on all the books I read and then look at what I actually talked about on my channel, there are some books that are missing that I like just didn't get to. And they're books that like, I'm gonna regret not mentioning or talking about at least one. And so I figured today I would address that and I would pick three books that I feel like I really loved in their own particular way from last year and get around to talking about them. The first book I wanna talk about is A Brightness Long Ago by Guy Gabriel K. I am basically making this entire video because of this book, because this was probably one of my favorite books that I read last year. And the fact that I have not talked about it in any way, shape or form feels a little bit like a crime for me. I am the only one judging myself for this crime, but I feel that. I feel strongly about the fact that I have not talked about it. A Brightness Long Ago is a historical fantasy book. It's set sort of like in a Renaissance era Italy kind of situation. And it has a lot of this conflict going on between different like families, city state kind of territory things. So that is the backdrop. It's this very like, you know, reminded me of my AP modern European history textbook just like unfolded in a book. The book is sort of a multi point of view kind of book, but it's not like full Game of Thrones. Like every chapter is a character and through the whole book, you're gonna get all of these different characters. Like you're gonna see their story like unfolding um, in that way. It's not like fully like that. It's mostly told through like the first person point of view of this narrator named Danny Sarah. He is working for this really awful, gross count in the beginning of the book, but uh, also very early on in the book, Danyo witnesses someone coming in to kill the Count. And that event like sets off a whole lot of stuff politically, a whole lot of stuff personally. And it just sets off a lot of events that drive the whole book. We see how Danyo navigates a lot of the complicated fallout that ensues. He's one of those characters who's very resourceful and very like wily in a way that is super fun. And because he's telling this through a first person point of view, but he's also doing it like in a retrospective kind of point of view, there's a really fun element of him like basically you you feel like you're having a story told to you by this like old dude who's like looking back on his life and I really love that in a book I love books that feel like someone who's like really looking back and reflecting and seeing how all of the choices in there that they've made have really come together. And then there's all these third person narrations told through these other characters point of view where we're seeing how these events are affecting them as well. So it has this really cool feeling of like, yes, we have this very almost self-centered kind of narrative narrative going on. Um, self-centered is a little bit of a judgy way to put it. Cause I think like, you know, if you're telling a story about yourself, of course it's self-centered, but it's cool to see that self-centered narrative kind of juxtaposed with all of these other characters whose own lives are like tremendously impacted by what is going on and seeing how all of these different pieces come together almost in fateful ways at times. And that really becomes a strong element throughout the book, the idea of fate and of coincidence, I guess. And there's also this looming existential threat in the background of the novel as well. So there's just a lot going on in a really, really fun way. And I like the way that Kay kind of broke it up into also discrete events that somehow managed to make all of these different threads come together without feeling too pat, like without it all feeling too neat. This book reminds me a lot of one of my favorite fantasy series, Kushiel's Dart, because it really combines like this beautiful language, that kind of retrospective storytelling and just like epic courtly politics, like international politics too, sort of. Like it, it combines all of those so well. And I have been searching for a book that feels like Kushiel's Dart for so long because I love that book so much, but there's a limit to like how much I can reread it. And also like just sometimes when you reread it, there are times now where I'm kind of like, okay, what elements are not working? And so I'm getting to a point where I just want other books that feel like the same thing, but different. So I can just have something kind of new, but in the same realm. And so this book definitely felt like that. And it's definitely made me want to read more of Kay's work because I'm like, I feel like feel like this is what I've been searching for. So the next book that I didn't get around to talking about last year, but I totally 
meant to and should have, um, was the book Press Reset, Ruin and Recovery in the Video Game Industry by Jason Schreier. I read this as an arc from NetGalley and one of the reasons why I picked this up is because I really enjoy a book that is about shambolic businesses and while I do not know that much about the video game industry, I was really curious about like, you know, the ruin and recovery in the video game industry that is promised in the book's subtitle. Each chapter goes through a pretty specific story, like it takes on a specific video game and the, the work that went into making it, but also the business choices around it and how that affects the creative choices, how that affects like people's personal lives and just how all of that unfolds into the actual reality of how video games get made, even though it also feels like at times like they are barely getting made, like they're getting made by the skin of like a hundred people's or a thousand people's teeth. There's lots of companies buying up other companies. There's weird pressures that are coming in from previous success. There's things like, you know, the, the obvious tension between like any creative industry and the professional expectations that, you know, come from actually trying to profit off of a creative enterprise. So there is a lot going on in the book. And so the structure of it makes it very manageable where it, like, especially for me, at, like as someone who does not know really that much about video games or the video game industry, I really appreciated the structure of the book where each one focuses on a specific story because I think what Schreier does really really well is tell a story that explains the history and the context be behind each video game so that you understand like the actual creative work that goes into them and the actual technological work that goes into them and to understand how those things fit together. If I look at a video game, I'm like, holy shit, there is so much work that goes into that. Like I, I the animation, the artwork, the story, the programming, the gameplay, like all of that I can like loosely say, sure, that is a lot of work. But I think Schreier is really good about building specifics so that you have like more of a specific context for what it is that people are doing and what it is that they're building on and what the stakes are for them as well as they're working on building these games. And he does a lot of interviews with people who have worked in the, these industries, who have worked on those specific games. And I really appreciated that because I, like I said, I love a shambolic business story. Like I love Bad Blood. I love like story of Uber, WeWork, all of those, like I will live listen to any podcast that tells you about how a business has fallen apart based on its own like over promising or whatever. At the same time, at the heart of all of these stories are like real people who were invested in making whatever that business was actually work. Like they wanted to make something that was going to be good and they have invested their creative energy, they've invested their time, they've invested a lot of effort into making that thing work. And I think the way that his book is structured, like combining these stories with these interviews really, really emphasizes kind of the personal stakes that happens in these industries. There's also a lot of discussion throughout the book of like how to address the issues that are coming up. Like how do we create a better industry? And I really enjoyed that as well. I thought that was really, I don't know, just a good idea. <laughs> like you don't want the book to just be like, the video game industry is fucked and like there's nothing else like it's just people being miserable all the time. I think that it gave the book an opportunity to also be optimistic and to emphasize that like the people who are working in it they're not like just complaining to complain they're complaining based on real things that they've experienced and also because at the end of the day they still love what they do like they love what they're working on and they want it to be better and the last book i wanted to talk about that i didn't get a chance to talk about in 2021 i don't feel super guilty about this because this is like one of the last books that i read in 2021 um, but this is a marvelous light by freya mars so a marvelous light is a historical romance it's got some magic so it's got some fantasy elements to it we've got two men we've got robin who has recently inherited this title but he also needs to support his sister and himself because his parents have made some choices that have left them uh, not destitute like they still have stuff but like he still like needs to find ways to support his sister and him um, so he has taken on this job in the civil service that it turns out actually involves liaising with some, some magic people. <laughs> and he didn't know about magic before, but he sure does now, um, especially thanks to his colleague Ed Edwin who is a grumpy magic sort of dude. You know, over the course of this book, they're gonna fall in love, but the real pressing issue, like aside from falling in love, is that Robin has now become the subject of someone's like threats. So there's some vindictive shit going on. Like there's something kind of violent happening that involves the magic that they are working near or around. So it's not clear like who's actually being targeted and what for, but it's up to Robin and Edwin to actually figure out what's going on. So, you know, falling in love, 
and not dying. Very good priorities. To be honest, I was not going to read this book initially because I fully judged it by its cover. Like I would see it pop up online and I just saw the cover and I, this is not the artist's fault. This is the trend's fault. I really hate this trend. Like, I, it's, sorry, I'm doing this rant that like so many people in romance booktube, like depending on where you are on this, like this fight, you are either over it or you're not. I am personally on the side of this general romance cover trend where I prefer the old cheesier covers. I don't super love this trend toward illustrated covers and especially, especially what I am really hating right now is there is this trend towards covers with characters who like just barely have faces. Like there is an acknowledgement that there is a face shape thing, but they barely have features on them. And I am not a fan. I just, I, I miss the cheesy poses. I miss the like wistful longing looks, like all of that theatric kind of stuff. I really love that. And so I don't hate illustrated covers. Some of them are great. Some of them are beautiful. And I think they're most beautiful when they're expressive, when they do something expressive that feels like it matches like the romance genre overall. And these covers for me just like don't match that kind of expression. And like I said, I don't blame the artist. I think the cover itself is beautiful on its own. I just don't love this trend overall for romance novels. So that is just my own personal take and it's why I almost didn't read this book. But then I read a review of it on NPR and the review was really positive about it in a way that I was like, okay, maybe I'll give it a chance. Like maybe I will read it. And especially it was the end of the year and I was like in that holiday mood where I was like, I kind of just want to curl up on a couch and read like an adventure. I just want to read some people have like this weird magical adventure and see how it all unfolds. And I think the NPR review really sold me on the fact that there was like a strong magic plot to all of this that I was going to get invested in. I did read this book like right at the end of the year. So I can't be too mad that I didn't cover it in any 2021 videos because like, yeah, I read it at the end of the year. This is also why even if I was going to do a 2021 best of list, I never make it until to like, you know, the next year because I am that person who is definitely convinced that I am going to read my favorite book at the end of the year. And this year that almost kind of happened because I really, really love this book. I just thought it was so much fun. That romance, that adventure that I was promised from the review that all worked so well for me. The dialogue is funny. If you love that kind of dry humor, which I do, it worked super well for me. It meant that the characters had really good banter with each other and I really enjoyed it. I, I feel like I sound like I'm on like was it Love Island where they talk about banter I don't I don't know I don't know if I mean banter in the same way that they mean banter but I really like the bantering in this book um the adventure was also really compelling which I was a little bit surprised by even though yes that is what I was looking for the book for because sometimes with romance novels that have like a really strong b plot to it that is not romantic Sometimes I zone out a little because I am so invested in the romance that I'm like, you know, anything else I'm kind of like, I treat it as window dressing and that is on me. That is my bad reader habit, but that's fine. <laughs> like at the end of the day, I, I have enjoyed plenty of books still with that mindset. I really enjoyed the magical subplot in this book. I liked the way that the conspiracy kind of wrapped around the characters and in ways that really brought out really specific aspects of both of their stories that I really enjoyed. I think both Robin and Edwin have really great arcs over the course of this book. And one of the things that's really surprising to me is that this book feels like a slow burn. Like it romantically, that romance, that love story, it is a slow burn. They do not like immediately have like a shit ton of lust over each other or anything like that, which I really love. I love a good slow burn. At the same time, I think the entire course of this story takes place like over a week. So overall, like I'm just kind of in awe of the fact that like the author was able to plot out this really fast story. <laughs> like it technically is very fast, but in a way that feels like slow and deliberate and like in a good way, in a way where like you are so drawn in and nothing ever feels too fast or too slow. Like it all feels like right to me. And I just loved seeing how all of that gets laid on top of each other, how the set different settings that we're going to and how like the magic is sort of woven in into these different characters' lives and how that works in this whole world and also at times doesn't work. That all worked super well for me and seeing that kind of get overlaid with the tension between Robin and Edwin as they get to know each other better, but also start to understand the ways that like, they're maybe not always on the same page or there's there's like this inherent distrust between them as well because of some stuff. I, I liked seeing the characters work through that and I liked seeing the result at the end. And I think in general, I am in this mood for like fun adventure romance kind of books right now. And so this fits in really well with the book that I actually talked about um, 
well, I like just filmed this video, but I am posting it the week before I post this video. Um, but this book that I, I talked about in my library check-in video, Paladin's Grace by T. Kingfisher. And I think they have like a really similar vibe of just being like fun, fantasy, adventure, romance, where the plots around the characters may be a little chaotic at times, but it all, for me at least, fits together really well with the romantic arcs and I'm just like really invested in everyone's story. I'm interested in their angst. I'm interested in seeing how they work through all of that angst together alongside the actual life-threatening emergencies that are happening around them. So those two books are really fitting a vibe for me right now that I am like really happy about. So if you guys have recommendations for more books like that, let me know. Uh, there is going to be a follow-up to this book. There's going to be a sequel coming out in November, which I'm really excited about, um, called A Restless Truth. It's going to feature Robin's sister and the actress slash ma magician. Actress slash magician. Actress slash magician. That is like weirdly hard to say. The actress magician that she meets on a ship. So I'm very excited for that. I am really excited to see where this series goes and how it kind of builds on all of this um, because I really love the characters in this book and I, I really wanna see where they go. So yeah, those are three books from 2021 that I did not actually originally get around to talking to in 2021, but it finally, finally addressed and I feel a tremendous amount of relief because I have gotten it off my chest that I have really, really enjoyed these books and I would recommend them to people if you're looking for anything that sounds remotely like them. So thanks so much you guys for watching and bye.